Hi, this is George, and you're watching The Return of the King Channel. In April of 2024, the last of three eclipses to cross America will appear. The prophet Joel tells us the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Solar eclipses occur on a regular basis, so there has to be something more. In Revelation 22, 12, and 13, Jesus says this. He says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The path of the three eclipses form the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph, which in the Greek alphabet is the Alpha. The path of the first and last eclipse forms the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Tav, which in the Greek alphabet is the Omega. The eclipses now appear to be trying to tell us something, but there's more. The intersection of the first and last eclipse occurs in a location known as Little Egypt. Of all the countries in the world, why is the Alpha and the Omega, and now a reference to Egypt, appearing over America? because America was set up by the Founding Fathers for a very specific purpose. This is one side of the Great Seal of the United States, which can be found on the back of the $1 bill. Contained within the Great Seal is a prophecy of a new world order headed by a one-world leader, the one we call the Antichrist. It was in Egypt where God showed the nations of the world who the most powerful God was, the God of the Hebrews. God took his people out of the most powerful nation in the world at that time, Egypt, by defeating their gods. He then hardened Pharaoh's heart and caused him to pursue the Israelites. God parted the Red Sea and his people passed through safely to the other side. Pharaoh and his army entered the Red Sea and then God drowned them. None survived. America is the most powerful nation in the world. And just like in Egypt, where the people of God multiplied into a nation, Christianity grew mightily in a land that serves foreign gods. When the oppression by the Egyptians became severe, God took them out of Egypt. As the opposition to Christianity and its values grows, not just in America, but worldwide, God will take his people out just like he did in Egypt. The principalities and powers that rule over America have been summoned here by a hidden ruling elite. They are the same demonic entities as those that ruled over Egypt, the most powerful nation at that time. These demonic gods who rule the nations at the request of men will be defeated, just as they were in Egypt. Tom Horn, in his book, Zenith 2016, goes into great detail as to the purpose of America's founding, to lead the world in the creation of a new world order led by the Antichrist. Speaking of the Great Seal, he says this, The Great Seal of the United States is a prophecy hidden in plain sight by the Founding Fathers and devotees of Bacon's New Atlantis for more than 200 years, foretelling the return of a terrifying demonic god who seizes control of earth and the new order of the ages. The supernatural entity was known and feared in ancient times by different names, Apollo, Osiris, and even farther back as Nimrod, whom Masons consider to be the father of their institution. Our escape in Revelation chapter 12 is from the dragon, Satan, and his incarnate son, the Antichrist. Was the United States designed to produce the Antichrist? David Bay of Cutting Edge Ministries believes so. America was designated as the new Atlantis that would lead the world to the Antichrist. The original national bird envisioned by our Masonic leadership in the late 1700s was not the American eagle, but the phoenix bird. This historic fact strongly suggests that at the right moment in world history, with the world entering through the portals of the kingdom of the Antichrist, America might suddenly be emoliated in fiery flames, burning to the ashes. Out of these ashes, the new world order would arise. 33rd degree Freemason Manley P. Hall, author of the book, The Secret Destiny of America, originally published in 1944, said this about America. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, 
but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The great seal is the signature of this exalted body, unseen and for the most part unknown. And the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is a trestle board, setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the United States government was dedicated from the day of its inception. It is 32nd degree Freemasons, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, that made the decision to place the great seal of the United States on the dollar bill. It is only the Freemasons who have achieved the title of 32nd or 33rd degree who are involved in the bringing of the New World Order to realization. Those at the 32nd and 33rd degrees of Freemasonry believe that in the Garden of Eden it was the serpent Lucifer who wanted to enlighten Adam and Eve, and it was Yahweh who wanted to keep them in the dark. Their allegiance is to the dragon of Revelation chapter 12. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This path here is the path of the solar eclipse that occurred in 2017. It occurred 33 days prior to the Revelation 12 sign. It is the 233rd day of the year. It is 133 days prior to the last day of the year. It begins in Oregon, the 33rd state. It ends in Charleston, South Carolina, which is located approximately on the 33rd parallel. Charleston is the location of the first Supreme Council of the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasons in the United States, called the Mother Lodge of the World. This is the path of the third eclipse, the eclipse of 2024. The location where the two eclipses intersect is known as Little Egypt. The rituals performed by the Freemasons to deify the Antichrist are based on the rituals performed by the Egyptians to deify the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. It was in 1934, 32nd degree Freemasons, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, came up with the idea to feature the Great Seal of the United States on the dollar bill. Like 33rd degree Freemason Manley P. Hall, 32nd degree Freemasons FDR and Henry Wallace understood the secret meaning contained within the Great Seal. The idea of using the Great Seal on coinage or currency began with then Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace in 1934. Wallace got the idea after looking through a State Department publication titled The History of the Seal of the United States. Turning to page 53, I noted the colored reproduction of the reverse side of the seal. The Latin phrase, Novus Ordu Seclorum, impressed me as meaning the New Deal of the Ages. I was struck by the fact that the reverse side of the seal had never been used. Therefore, I took the publication to President Roosevelt and suggested a coin be put out with the obverse and reverse sides of the seal. Roosevelt, as he looked at the colored reproduction of the seal, was first struck with the representation of the all-seeing eye, a Masonic representation of the great architect of the universe. Next, he was impressed with the idea that the foundation for a new order of the ages had been laid in 1776, but that it would be completed only under the eye of the great architect. Roosevelt, like myself, was a 32nd degree Mason. He suggested that the seal be put on the dollar bill rather than a coin and took the matter up with the Secretary of the Treasury. He brought it up in a cabinet meeting and asked James Farley, Postmaster General and a Roman Catholic, if he thought the Catholics would have any objection to the all-seeing eye, which he as a Mason looked on as a Masonic symbol of deity. Farley said, no, there would be no objection. When the first draft came back from the Treasury, the obverse eagle side was on the left of the bill as is heraldic practice. Roosevelt insisted that the order be reversed so that the phrase of the United States would be under the obverse side of the seal. Here are FDR's initials, and here is where he requests the switching of the pyramid and the eagle. 
As high-level Masons, both FDR and Wallace comprehended the esoteric and secret meanings embedded within the Great Seal. Both FDR and Wallace were well acquainted with the teachings of Luciferian Nicholas Rohrich, who is an instructor of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Secret Doctrine. Madame Blavatsky published a periodical named Lucifer. Within these secret societies, Lucifer is perceived as an angel of light. According to their beliefs, it was Lucifer in the Garden of Eden who enlightened Adam and Eve, enabling them to open their eyes and become like gods. In contrast, Jehovah is considered evil and is believed to want to keep mankind in the darkness. Right here on the cover of the magazine, she says, The light bearer is the morning star, or Lucifer. Wallace and Roosevelt, both 32nd degree Masons, comprehended the concealed prophecy within the Great Seal. This letter penned to Guru Rorich on March 12, 1933 by the future Vice President Wallace vividly illustrates that understanding. Dear Guru, I have been thinking of you holding the casket, the sacred most precious casket, and I have thought of the new country going forward to meet the seven stars under the sign of the three stars, and I have thought of the admonition, Await the stone. We await the stone, and we welcome you again to this glorious land of destiny, clouded though it may be with strange, fumbling fears. Who shall hold up the compelling vision to those who wander in darkness? In answer to this question, we again welcome you to drive out depression, to drive out fear, and so I await your convenience prepared to do what I am to do. The stone they eagerly await is the capstone of the Great Pyramid, the Savior of the world whose arrival will metaphorically complete the pyramid and initiate the new world order. The seven stars are the Pleiades and the three stars the belt of Orion, of which the three pyramids of Giza align. In my latest video, I talked about the story of the rapture that appears in the heavens between April 8th and the 10th. The eclipse occurs on April 8th. Between the 8th and the 10th, we see a pictographic story of the great escape from the dragon. On the following day, April 11th, the story completes when the moon enters the Pleiades, signaling the coming of the Antichrist. The moon passes near the Pleiades every month, so what happens on the 11th by itself doesn't really mean much. It's the combination of what occurs in the days previous that gives us a complete story. The story of the pre-tribulation rapture, our escape from the dragon Satan and his incarnate son, the Antichrist. Every object in our solar system except Pluto is in the constellations of the rapture and coming tribulation. Plus, a comet will appear in the sky with the eclipse. On the third day from the eclipse, there is a very complete pictographic story of the rapture in the heavens. I'll talk about this in more detail later. The ancient Jewish rabbis believed the sun represented God, who we cannot look at, and the moon the Messiah. Just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, in the Messiah we see a reflection of God. The day you see here is the third day from the eclipse. The fourth day is about the coming of the Antichrist. On the fourth day, the moon moves into the Pleiades, the seven stars. Wallace, writing to Luciferian Rorich, says this, Dear Guru, I have been thinking of you holding the casket, the sacred most precious casket, and I have thought of the new country going forward to meet the seven stars under the sign of the three stars, and I have thought of the admonition, await the stone. The stone they are waiting for is the supernatural leader of the new order of the ages, the one we call the Antichrist. The sacred most precious casket is the casket of Osiris, which they believe is buried somewhere in the Giza pyramid complex. Revelation 17.8 appears to support this idea of the resurrection of some being who lived died, and is then resurrected. The beast you saw was, in other words, lived, and is not, he died and went to the pit, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast, because it was, and is not, and is to come. 
Tom Horn explains the connection between the constellation of Orion and the Antichrist. In Greek mythology, the god Orion, Osiris, fell in love with Apollo's sister, Diana, Artemis. Apollo did not like this arrangement and tricked Diana into shooting an arrow into Orion's head. When she saw what she had done, Diana placed the dead Osiris among the stars and transformed him into the constellation Orion. Thereafter, Orion was thought to be the soul of Osiris. Early history connects the constellation of Orion to the Sumerian legend of Gilgamesh, identified in the Bible as Nimrod, the giant mighty hunter before the Lord, a fantastic personality who in later mythology was also called Osiris and Apollo. If Job 38.31 is therefore interpreted according to these ancient astrological and mythological renderings, it would have God asking Job if he could bind the magic bands of Osiris Dionysus or loose the bindings of the mighty hunter, the giant, Orion, Gilgamesh, Nimrod, Osiris, Apollo. What is potentially more explosive is the deep possible implication from this text that not only can God do this, that is, loose the forces bound at Giza, the pyramid complex, and the constellation Orion, but that when the correct time comes, he will. He continues, when the star system Pleiades and Orion are compared to Henry Wallace's letter to Nicholas Rowrich, in which he says, Dear Guru, I have been thinking of you holding the casket, the sacred most precious casket, and I have thought of the new country going forward to meet the seven stars under the sign of the three stars. The mystery may unfold that Wallace was referring to the Pleiades and Orion specifically and to the deity and earthly location they represent. This is an excellent possibility as these star systems, the seven stars of the Pleiades and the three stars of Orion, relate to one another in mythology as well as in the Bible. Seek him that maketh the seven stars of the Pleiades and the three stars of Orion, Amos 5.8, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, Job 9.9. 9. Further, both star systems represent the God encoded in the Great Seal, the central fascination of Wallace and Roosevelt. The Pleiades point to Apollo Dionysus, while the Orion system points to the soul of Osiris in heaven, and on earth to his speculative tomb located in Giza. Rorich and Wallace may have believed the new country, America as the new Atlantis, was destined to meet Apollo Dionysus under the sign of the three stars on the Giza Plateau, where the most precious casket or coffin of Osiris Apollo Dionysus held the material remains of the god. Furthermore, what is now known is that Wallace viewed the unfinished pyramid with the all-seeing eye hovering above it on the Great Seal as a prophecy about the dawn of a new world order with America at its head. Whenever the United States assumed its position as the new capital of the world, Wallace wrote, the grand architect would return and metaphorically the all-seeing eye would be fitted atop the Great Seal pyramid as the finished apex stone. For that to happen, Wallace penned in 1934, it will take a more definitive recognition of the grand architect of the universe before the apex stone, capstone of the pyramid, is finally fitted into place and this nation, in the full strength of its power, is in position to assume leadership among the nations in inaugurating the new order of the ages. Whatever the case for Wallace, like Manley Hall had, he and Roosevelt viewed the all-seeing eye above the unfinished pyramid as pointing to the return or reincarnation of this coming Savior, whose arrival would cap the pyramid and launch the new world order. The all-seeing eye of the Great Seal is fashioned after the Eye of Horus, the offspring of Osiris, or Osiris resurrected, as both men surely understood. Alistair Crowley, 33rd degree Freemason, the wickedest man on earth, and a Rorich occult contemporary, often spoke of this as the new age of Horus and the breaking dawn of the rebirth of Osiris. That such mystics and Freemasons simultaneously use such identical language is telling. 
giving that the great seal's mottos and symbolism relate to both Osiris and Apollo specifically yet as one. Osiris is the dominant theme of the Egyptian symbols, his resurrection and return, while the models of the seal point directly to Apollo and the eagle, a pagan emblem of Jupiter, to Apollo's father. According to Virgil and the Cumion Sibyl, whose prophecy form the Novus Ordo Seclorum of the Great Seal of the United States, the New World Order begins during a time of chaos, when the earth and oceans are tottering, a time like today. This is when the Son of Promise arrives on earth, Apollo incarnate, a pagan savior born of a new breed of men sent down from heaven, when heroes and gods are blended together. This sounds eerily similar to what the Watchers did during the creation of the Nephilim, and to what scientists are doing this century through genetic engineering of human-animal chimeras. But to understand why such a fanciful prophecy about Apollo, son of Jupiter, returning to Earth should be important to you. In ancient literature, Jupiter was the Roman replacement of Yahweh as the greatest of the gods, a counter-Yahweh. His son Apollo is a replacement of Jesus, a counter-Jesus. This Apollo comes to rule the final New World Order when justice returns, returns old Saturn's, Satan's reign. In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, John is going to tell us in a remarkable way who this God is. It's the same God foretold of in the great seal. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. He then, a little farther down, says this, They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. What John is telling us here is not quite right. It should read, They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollia. So why is John doing this? What John is doing here is telling us who this king is. He's telling us it's the god Apollo. This is a commentary I found explaining what John is doing. There is little doubt a link between Apollyon and Apollo. Let me elaborate. The name Apollyon is a Greek play on words for Apollo, Apollon in Greek, and destroyer. Revelation 9.11 reads, They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. Abaddon means destruction or ruin, which is Apollia in Greek. Though Abaddon means destruction or ruin, it is truly the place of destruction or ruin, which in Greek is Hades or Buso or Abuso. Why does John call the angel of the abyss the name for destruction or the place of destruction in Hebrew, but then uses the Greek word Apollyon, meaning destroyer, which is not an exact Greek translation of the Hebrew Abaddon. John's appeal to call the angel of the abyss Apollyon rather than using the more exact Greek translations of Abaddon like Apollia, Hades, Buso, or Abuso, because of the similarity between the words destroyer, Apollyon, and Apollo, Apollon in Greek. In other words, this word selection appears to be a word play for Apollo, Apollon, and destroyer, Apollyon. The fact that Apollyon is used to intentionally call to mind the god Apollo is hinted at throughout Revelation 9. The Anchor Bible Dictionary says the following concerning the link between Apollyon and Apollo. In one manuscript, instead of Apollyon, the text reads Apollo, the Greek god of death and pestilence or plague like the plagues of locusts mentioned in Revelation 9. Apollyon is no doubt the correct reading. Now, when copies of the original manuscripts were being made, sometimes the copyist would know what's being implied and would put that understanding into the copy. That's what's going on with this one manuscript here. Having these altered copies is helpful in understanding what the intent of the author was. In this case, it helps confirm our understanding that it was John's intent to let us know that this god is Apollo. And then it continues, But the name Apollo, Greek Apollon, was often linked in ancient Greek writings with the verb Apollomai or Apollio, destroy. 
From this time of Grotus, Apollyon has often been taken here to be a play on the name Apollo. The locust was an emblem of this god. John in the book of Revelation is telling us this king who rules over the demonic entities who dwell in the bottomless pit is the god Apollo, the same god found on the great seal who is coming to rule over the entire earth. On the fourth day from the eclipse, at sunset from Jerusalem, the moon representing Messiah, Jesus the Lamb, is in the Pleiades, and to the left is the constellation Orion. The seven stars, the Pleiades, under the sign of the three stars, the belt of Orion, spoken of by Wallace, appears on the day after the story of the rapture appears. What a coincidence. In Job 38:31, God asked Job, Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, the seven stars, or loose the cords or the belt of Orion? The answer is, no, he can't. But God can and will at the right time. The tribulation begins in Revelation 6-1 when the Lamb, Jesus, opens the first of seven seals, releasing the four horsemen. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come. In the storytelling in the heavens, the constellation that follows the Lamb is the constellation of Taurus, representing Christ the Judge and the start of the tribulation. On this day, the moon, representing the Lamb, who starts the tribulation, is in the constellation of Christ the Judge, Taurus. Not only is it in the constellation of Taurus, but it's in the Pleiades at sunset, foreshadowing the release of the four horsemen and the start of the tribulation. I don't expect the tribulation to start on this day. The start of the tribulation is tied to the fall feasts, and the covenant that the Antichrist makes with humanity found in Daniel 9.27. It's going to take months for the world to recover from the shock of millions of people disappearing. On the third day from the eclipse, we find the story of our escape from the dragon in the sea via the rapture. On the third day from the eclipse at sunset from the Sea of Galilee, looking west over the sea, we see the head of the sea serpent Cetus above the waters. Above the head of the dragon, the dragon of Revelation chapter 12, is the planet Jupiter, symbolizing the male child, the Christian, who the dragon is looking to devour. The moon, representing the Messiah, Jesus, the bridegroom, is in the constellation of the Lamb, along with Jupiter. Between the moon and Jupiter is the devil comet, so named because it has been observed to sprout twin tails on occasion. In Revelation chapter 12, there is a war in the heavens. That war has to do with the rapture. The comet sits between the moon and Jupiter, the bride and the bridegroom, symbolic of the dragon's attempt to prevent Christ's snatching of his bride to heaven. What happened at Mount Sinai is a type or foreshadowing of the rapture. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. If we count the days in the same manner as God did at Mount Sinai, then the day we are looking at here, the tenth, is the third day. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. There's really no reason for us to need to know that the wedding is on the third day, unless there's a hidden or prophetic reason. It takes the moon seven days to travel from the constellation of Aries to the constellation representing heaven, Cancer. A Jewish wedding at the time of Christ lasted seven days. Our wedding with Christ will last seven years. What we see in the heavens starting on day one with the eclipse and ending on day three is the story of the rapture. Could the rapture occur on this day? It could. 
There's nothing in the Bible that says God can't reveal the day of the rapture to us. The signs in the heavens to be watching for are found in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and they appear to be completed on the days following the eclipse. The book of Revelation begins with this verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, God the Father, gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to him by God the Father. Jesus may not have known the day of the rapture or the start of the tribulation when he walked the earth as God in human form. But now that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, the book of Revelation tells us that he does know. The very first verse of Revelation lets us know this, and that he's revealed it to John, the disciple Jesus loved. There's a war in the heavens, and that war has to do with the rapture. That war could delay the rapture in the same manner that the response to Daniel's prayer was delayed 21 days because the angelic messenger had to do battle with the prince of Persia. Only time will tell. The story of the rapture starting with the eclipse and ending on the day you see here is covered in detail in this video. There's a link appearing here at the upper right hand corner and another link will appear shortly at the end of this video. The other video that's a must watch is the video I released last fall on September 23rd, 2023, six years to the day from the Revelation 12 sign. The Exodus is a type or foreshadowing of the rapture and tribulation. The land of Egypt is mentioned over 600 times in the Bible. Egypt, symbolizing the world, becomes the land where God places and grows his chosen people, the Israelites, into a nation within a nation. Egypt at that time is the most powerful nation in the world. In the eyes of the surrounding nations, that means they must also have the most powerful gods. God single-handedly defeats and makes a mockery of the gods the Egyptians serve. God makes sure we know that he's in total control by letting us know that he's involved in not just hardening Pharaoh's heart, but his entire army at the Red Sea. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Paul in Romans 9.17 says this, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. What happened to the Egyptians, the plagues, and then the defeat of the most powerful army in the world at the Red Sea, by the God of the Hebrews, becomes known to all the nations in the world. And those nations are now in fear of the God of the Hebrews. If the nation with the most powerful gods can be defeated by the God of the Hebrews, then so can they. This is exactly what Paul is alluding to. All the nations that served other gods would see who the most high God was, the God of the Hebrews, and they would come to fear him and his people, the Israelites. America, over the last 75 years, has been considered to be one of the most powerful nations in the world, based on its military strength and its standard of living. America is symbolic of Egypt and the world. America was founded to bring about the new world order with the Antichrist as its leader. This is not by chance or coincidence. God is involved in this. America is Babylon. During the tribulation, America will be destroyed. Babylon in Revelation chapter 18 is destroyed in one day by fire. All the merchants of earth mourn over her. What happened to the Egyptians and their gods, their utter defeat is going to happen again. Except this time, instead of Egypt, it will be the whole world and its armies. Instead of Pharaoh, it will be Satan, the current ruler of this world and his incarnate son, the Antichrist, 
along with the false prophet who is going to go down in defeat at the hands of the coming king and his armies, Jesus Christ. Here are the two links to the videos I've mentioned. Just click on the link and it will take you to the video. Thanks for watching.